<laughs> hey, y'all, it's Ephraim Smith, and this is episode three. Can you believe it? Yes, we've already had one episode for God the Father, one episode for God the Son, one episode for God the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe in any of that stuff, it's just the third episode. Uh, so I know this. You're going to love this episode, and I want to introduce my friend, pastor, author, national speaker, uh, just a fun guy to have in my contacts. Wow. This is Pastor Caleb Kaltenbach. Good to have you, Dude, man. Dude, thanks for having me, man. Like I said, I've been following you for years. Are we going to do years. a fist bump, too? We can there do that. Go. Sorry, I didn't mean to blow it up. I know That's we right. don't do that. Um <laughs> Dude, I've been following you for years. I love your ministry, love your work, love what you're doing. You're an awesome dude, man. Oh, man, I appreciate you. Now, you know, we talk about issues that impact the city, urban areas. And uh, there are times when we talk about um, social issues around race, uh, around class. Uh, We talk about uh, that, you know, cities still remain this mission field, this place that is ever increasing, multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, yet deeply divided and polarized. Well, there's one other thing that we have to talk about when we're talking about the city, and that's human sexuality. It's the way in which sexuality impacts for so many people their core identity. Now, we know that human sexuality and uh, specifically uh, the LGBTQ community, that's not limited to the city. I mean, members of the LGBTQ community live all over the United States. They live in rural areas. They live in suburbs. They live all across this planet. But um, the cities become a place uh, where uh, there are pride festivals and parades. Uh, it's kind of the center of, of dialogue and connection uh, on politics, on power, on uh, navigating uh, the various social domains of how members of the LGBT community see themselves in media, in entertainment, in the marketplace, in politics, in religion and church. So that's why this discussion is so important. Now, I'm going to disappoint you. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this, you're going to be disappointed because this episode is not trying to bring you to some kind of theological conclusion on human sexuality. So we're not going to spend this time reading theological statements, faith statements. We're not going to go back and forth between how the evangelical church looks at human sexuality, how the mainline Protestant church looks at it, the Catholic church. We're actually just going to have some conversation. A real conversation. Yes. Just a real messy conversation that's going to include topics like grace, love, forgiveness, community, dialogue, pain, discomfort, brokenness, disappointment. All of those things, hope, vision, happiness, might all come into the conversation, but, uh, you know, there are so many places you could go to get just a great polarizing, divisive debate about this issue. So if that's what you need today, go there. Twitter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and there are places not just to be negative where you can actually uh, find some hope and, and, and go, OK, what does scripture say about this? That's important. We do that every once in a while. We we write about this. We preach on it. We teach it. But I really just wanted to have you here so that we could have a dialogue. Because for you, this is deeper than a doctrine. This is deeper than a theological statement. This is your story. It's my experience, yeah. So why don't we start there? Let's start with um, how you enter. Because some people in the church, they enter into this issue, this topic, strictly from, well, this is what the Bible says. This is what my church says. This is where I've come to a conclusion on. Uh, at, but for you, it starts at a much more personal, deeper place. So let's start there. Share your entrance into this issue of human sexuality. My entrance into it was basically when I was born. Uh, my parents were professors at the University of Missouri-Columbia, and when I was two years old, both of them 
uh, divorced and went into same-sex relationships. And my dad was in a uh, never in a monogamous relationship, and my mom was in a 22-year relationship with a psychologist named Vera. They moved to Kansas City, Missouri, um, became activists, joined the local board of directors for GLAAD, uh, took me with them to uh, pride parades, uh, bars, clubs. Um, so I was raised my whole childhood, growing up years, in the LGBTQ community in Kansas City, which was a very active and still is LGBTQ um, stronghold community area. Now, during this time, did faith enter your life? Like, uh, did did your your biological parents, whether your your father or your mother, uh, were they people of faith, or or were they walking out life separate from from religion or faith? So my dad took me to an Episcopal church every now and then. Um, uh, about every six weeks or so when he felt guilty about something, and we would go there. I uh, eventually served as an altar boy there. Uh, but, you know, the, the pastor, or reverend, he was a great guy, but he never really ever talked about Jesus. He never talked about faith. Um, you know, it was always social issues, which, which definitely are important, you know, and are definitely a huge application of Scripture. But we never got into who Jesus was. It was always everything else. Um, so I kind of grew up not knowing about Jesus. So my mom and Vera, they uh, uh, went to a Methodist church for a while, and then that really didn't work out. And then they ended up uh, practicing Zen Buddhism for a while, and then that didn't work out. Then they started practicing Wicca, and they had a coven at our house, and then they felt like that turned creepy. And then they ended up uh, becoming Quaker, um, mm. uh, not like as in uh, Yorville and a Friends Church, but more... Uh, Quaker, it's, it's a, I think it's more progressive uh, version of Quaker Society of Friends or something like that. Yeah, and but so, like, like Quakers that would have been like uh, uh, pacifists and, and uh, yeah. abolitionists and uh, to yeah, that degree. Yeah, or, I think so. I think so. But it was it was um, not like any kind of and and I've been to Friends churches and that kind of thing before, but it was not any kind of uh, Quaker church that we'd be familiar with now like for instance a worship service we'd go there and for a whole hour we'd sit in silence i I was gonna say how old were you then because i was saying for a little boy that would be a little complicated um i was eight and it was torture yeah like i i got so bored i remember getting excited because there was an ant crawling on a chair one time and i was like man i can watch that ant you know, because it was just so boring. So I grew up really having no context of who Jesus really was. And when I learned about Jesus, the people who taught me about Jesus were the people that mistreated uh, my mother and her friends. I was marching when I was in elementary school with my mom and her partner Vera in this pride parade. And at the end of the parade, there were these individuals holding up signs saying, God hates you, turn or burn. And if that wasn't offensive enough, there were people spraying water and urine on people in the parade, these quote-unquote Christians saying, this is what Jesus thinks of you. And I looked at my mom, and I said, why are they acting like that? And she said, Caleb, they're Christians, and Christians hate gay people. If you are not like them, they will not like you. And so I never wanted to be a Christian after that, because I thought to myself, if Christians are this bad, I can't imagine how awful Jesus Christ is. And and you're— Growing up with, you know, a lesbian mother with a lesbian partner, with a partner, mm-hmm. uh, that, that of course I don't even know why I said that. Like that was like some kind of equation that had to be solved. No, no, but um, you're growing up at a time, not that it's like totally, totally popular now, but I mean you can turn on your television and pretty much on ABC, CBS, NBC, Netflix, HBO, Showtime, you can, there's a series, there's a movie, there's a primetime show, and you now see, you know, a gay couple, a lesbian couple, someone that's bisexual. Um, You know, it's, it's, it's getting more and more where it's like seeing a lesbian couple or a gay couple bring their child to school or come to their child's play, uh, you know, we're seeing that. But I mean, for you, this was at a time where I'm like thinking it's totally taboo if, for you to to have your mom and your stepmom come to school and see you in a play or in the choir or in band practice or come to your teacher conferences or, or you, you with them. 
a lot more stairs probably a lot than more people stairs would get now a lot more stairs and i never told anybody that my parents were gay i never uh invited anybody over for a sleepover because i didn't want to get made fun of and i think that was a a real possibility especially in the 80s right um and and it probably still is today to a degree but not like it was back then you're absolutely right so there was a sense in which part of me was like there's nothing wrong with it you know i'm I'm cool with it there's another part of me where i was just like i knew i was different um and i knew that i would be made fun of because i heard about all i heard all the jokes that people would make in school I'm like, man, if they find out about my mom and her partner and my dad, I'm toast. So I just kept that to myself. Um, yeah. But back to the only, well, not the only, but the predominant image, except being in the Quaker church or the Methodist church or the Episcopal church, um, if we were just to take evangelicals, mm. the Bible-believing people, Hallelujah. The, the Jesus is Lord all day, every day. Um, your experience with the people that really believe in Jesus, that believe you must be baptized, you you must know Jesus, the Holy Spirit's living in you, that group was presented to you. Your experience with that group is they hate my mom and they probably hate me too. Yeah, so you know what my reaction was? My reaction was I hated them. I didn't want to be around them. So you know what I did? I did what you and I would preach against. I categorized them. Mm. If I saw somebody that was a Christian, in my mind, they were automatically like the people on the street corners. Yeah. And I'm just like, I just, and that, and for me, I did that because of fear. And you know, fear is a constant companion in life. It's, it's not a bad thing. Like we should be afraid of things. Like we see a rattlesnake come in here. I'm running out the door, and hopefully you're behind me, Ephraim, but I'm out if a rattlesnake comes in here. <laughs> right. um, if a Bengal tiger comes in here, I'm gone. Um, but at the same time, when fear begins to direct the decisions of our life and dictate our direction, we will unintentionally end up hurting people um, because we naturally fear whatever it is we don't understand or what makes us feel powerless, You yeah. know, whether it's a people group, an idea, or a person. And we go immediately, I mean, you know this, you study culture and psychology, we go into fight or flight mode when in actuality, instead of fighting or fighting, we should actually lean in and get to know the person instead of categorizing them. But to me, that was my defense mechanism. So how do you move from fearing Christians, hating Christians, judging Christians, seeing them as the ones that hate your mother and her partner and that uh, also coming upon you as one that this is my mom. I love her. Mm-hmm. How do you then get to a position where you you become a Christian, though? Yeah, man. So I unintentionally leaned in, you know, empathy, like the opposite of fear and shame. I unintentionally leaned in. When I was 16, I got invited to this uh, Bible study led by a high schooler for high schoolers, and I thought it's going to be perfect. I'm going to pretend to be a Christian, learn about their faith, and dismantle it. <clears throat> and obviously that turned out, you know, real well, you know, for <laughs> good plan, Caleb. You're like, um, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to dismantle this. I'm yeah, going to deconstruct this. Deconstruct it. And I'm going to tell all of y'all that you're wrong. And that's just not what happened. Um, I went there and at the age of 16, I had never s- stepped into a, a Christian household that was conservative, evangelical, Baptist. I mean, you name it, Catholic, whatever. And I walked in there, and these people looked like they had dropped a Bible bookstore in their living room. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I mean, I've never seen people have framed pictures of animals on their walls, like sheep and lions. Framed pictures of animals they didn't own with Bible verses. I'm like, this is a weird place. Oh, something about the lamb, and there's a lamb. There's like yeah. The lamb that was slain, and there's yeah. a lamb. Yeah, there's the a picture. lamb with a dagger in it. And I'm like, oh. And then they're like, oh, we have to go down to the basement for the Bible study. And I'm like, I'm going to sacrifice a chicken down there. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I had a coven at my house at one time. Oh, yeah, I exactly. I know I know how this works, okay? <laughs> if I see a pentagram, I'm, I'm gone. And so then we went down there. They told everybody to, you know, read a verse out of this chapter in 1 Corinthians. I couldn't find it, so I read a verse in First Chronicles. Some dude got impaled. And they said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in, I'm in 1 Chronicles. And they said, well, you're in the Old Testament. And I'm like, so there's a New Testament. Like I, there's an updated 
I didn't know. And so here's what I learned. up from. First of all, they obviously saw through my little charade, but they still treated me with grace and they were kind and they gave me margin. They gave God margin to do spiritual heart surgery on my heart, you know, because coming to Jesus is a process. And then after we follow him, the rest of our lives is a process of surrender to him over and over and over again every single day. And then um, the other thing was is that, man, I just fell in love with Jesus. I mean, he's a cool dude. He's not like his followers, praise God, <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of them. And I was just like, I can get on board with that. And um, that that was the um, my beginning. That was the so end was of it, the old was Caleb. It, was it that night or was it— on, on a, a journey few, it, with it this journey. family. You, it was on a journey a with a couple different families, and um, I eventually became a Christian. And uh, got was back. your mom aware that you were connecting with this Christian family? Yeah, with but on the she wall? was proud because I was going to undermine them. Yeah, and She's, God was undermining me the whole time. And yeah. so I went, and um, finally I woke up, and I called one of my friends, Greg, one morning a few weeks later, and I said, "I think I've turned Christian. What should I do?" And he's like, well, let's go eat Chinese food, and I'll baptize you. And so we went, and I got baptized, and my parents had no clue. Okay, so you went to eat Chinese food, or was the Chinese food just a cover for going to get baptized? Like, tell your mama we're going to eat Chinese food, but we're really going to get baptized. Well, we did, yes, but it was a cover, but it was also lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah. We just left the baptism out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I felt like I wanted to be a pastor. Um mm. You know, a week later, That's I hadn't we told my common. parents. I, yeah. I, for some reason, I I became a Christian in high school. I grew up in the church, grew up in a in a black Baptist church, and um, but I was just kind of culturally going to church. I mean, my grandmother went to church, my mom went to church. They took me, and my grandmother and my mom sang in the choir, so I sang in the choir. Yeah, my mom was an usher, so then I became a junior usher. Mm. You know, so uh, they went to prayer meeting, I went to prayer meeting. Uh, and then in high school, though, um, I became a Christian. I went to a high school retreat. Uh, it was kind of a combo thing. I went to this high school retreat because I thought this girl I liked was going, mm -hmm. and then she ended up not going. So then um, <laughs> I but was, was but there. But you still went. Yeah, yeah, I went, and a uh, guy named Bart Campolo was speaking. Oh, and, is that uh, relation to Tony? Yeah, Tony's son. Okay. Um, and so, uh, who's a humanist now? Mm -hmm. so, really? Yeah, yeah. So, like, Bart or Tony? Bart, okay. his son. Yeah. So, uh, they have this great conversation where they uh, talk about that now, where, you know, Tony's still, you know, Christian, more yeah. more liberal in his theology. He's but, a good preacher. Oh, my gosh. He, you know... I, I don't normally cuss on the show where I quote one of one of my favorite lines <laughs> yeah. from him, you know, where he says, you know, there are millions of people hungry on this planet and nobody gives a doot. All right. Because we don't have the machines. I just had to do it. Yeah. And then uh, um, and he says, but you're more concerned that I said the S word than there's millions of people starving on this planet. So he came that to my, my Bible favorite college. line from Oh, him. dude, I love it. He came to my Bible college and preached that. And I clapped out loud. And after he cussed in chapel, about half the faculty got up and walked out. And I yeah. was like, you guys are a bunch of turds. I don't yeah. know if I can say that on here. Yeah, yeah, you can, not say, that. You can say that. Yeah. But it's, it's just kind of like, yeah. dude, grow up. Yeah. Grow so up. I only mention that because, I mean, I, I become a Christian at this high school retreat. Uh, it, it was a combo of this retreat. And then that summer they had this outdoor festival called the soul liberation festival. Hmm. It was like an outdoor revival. And so I heard like they been bringing these speakers. I heard John Perkins and Tony Campolo Dude. and Tony Evans. And Tony you Evans. can't hear all those people and not give your life to Christ. It's too much. The, Tony Evans. He's one of the first preachers I heard after I yeah. became a Christian and John Perkins. One of the best days of my life was when I got to meet him. Yeah. So I, so I, I, I go to the altar and uh, I tell my mom, and my mom tells me, uh, hey, you know, when I was pregnant with you, uh, I had this dream, and my grandmother, who had passed away, was in the dream, and she told me that baby in you is going to be a preacher. Dude. And he's going to spe speak to thousands of people. And, well, my first reaction was, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So I tried to, for a while, I tried to live as if I would never become a preacher. That didn't work. And so 
uh, here I am today. But mm-hmm. I just I just think that's interesting that you and I both become Christians as teenagers, and right away we're wrestling with, uh, am I a minister? Am I supposed to preach? What am I supposed to do? So you tell your mother and my and her partner and, and her my partner dad. who have been rejected by and Christians my dad. Yeah. and your dad that you're a Christian. What what's their response? They kicked me out. So your 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 mom and her partner and my dad an, and your dad. So my dad so you, lived in Columbia, Missouri. My mom and her partner lived in Kansas City. I couldn't go to either house. How old were you? I was sixteen. So because was, I told them so, that I had also changed my view on sexual intimacy, where I believe where I came to the conclusion, I came to two conclusions. Like one was um, that I still hold today. Both of these that um, you know that. My personal belief is that God designed sexual intimacy to be expressed in marriage between a man and a woman. My other belief and conviction is that a theological conviction is never a catalyst to devalue someone. That my beliefs on um, on marriage, relationships, sexual intimacy, uh, they do not obstruct my view of an individual or the worth I think they have or anything like that. They are just my views on marriage and relationships but they're not my view on this person. Every single person has value, the same intrinsic value, yes. because everyone is someone that God created and Jesus died for. Yeah, but, Period. But by stating this to your mother, this was, my son has become a part of the... I'm the enemy. The group that rejects me. So I'm going to reject... And she didn't even give me a chance to reject her, which I wouldn't have done, by the way. Yeah. But just you... So how did that come... Did you Did you feel you had to state your position on marriage and sexual intimacy because of like what made you feel like you had to state that they did position? oh because they wouldn't know you're a christian so what do you think about us yeah wow and 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 like at first i didn't say anything but they kept on grilling me wow and so finally i, I told them i said well this is what i believe about you know relationships but I, it doesn't impact my relationship with you that that must be I don't mean this as a judgment call. So you 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 definitely push back on this, but I'm just thinking that must be a lot of pain and rejection absorbed for a mother to kick her son out of that. Because I'm I'm I mean I don't want to make any assumptions, but I'm thinking before this moment, you're experiencing love and oh, nurture. My and mom and I from were your very mom. close. We have n- and even to this day, and she's dying of cancer. Um, right now, but even to this day, we are not as close as what we used to be. Not mm-hmm. at all. Um, I love my mom, but there's not that same closeness. Um, so yeah, it, it was very hard from both parents, but I stayed with different friends and, um, at the church youth group that I was attending till my parents let me come back. And here's what I learned from my, I would come home, I would study the Bible and I realized that a relationship with Jesus gives us the margin to love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. There are some things that we cannot forgive on our power alone. There are some people that we can't love by our power alone. However, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we can lean into his love for that per- person and his forgiveness of that person so that we can love and forgive that person. And I really credit Jesus for getting me through that and trying to really understand love and forgiveness, you know? Mm. Because when he says that, you know, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, I don't know that Jesus is talking about, hey, if you're going to follow me, you got to be homeless, even though to a degree Jesus was. I think Jesus is talking more about rejection. So as you're leaving your house at 16, knowing you can't go to your dad's house either, mm-hmm. um, do you remember what was your mom was she teary eyed? Was she angry? Was she like, do, do you still can, can you still see that mm-hmm. moment vividly of mm-hmm. the day you're leaving your house at 16? hundred percent, hundred percent. She was, she was teary eyed. Vera was teary eyed. And then they switched to anger real quick. Um, when they said, well, you, you need to recant this when well, I didn't use the word recant. You know, but the, you know that's Martin Luther type word <laughs> right, right. back in the Middle Ages. But you need to think differently about this, or else you can't be with us because you are rejecting us. Wow. You are not being tolerant of us. And I'm like, how am I being intolerant of you? 
I've never demanded that you have to come to my viewpoint. Never. Yeah. So you, know? you and and you would have stayed living there, loving them with this position. Hundred percent. Yeah. So how did you? So what does life look like for you at sixteen? Where did you end up going? Friends' house. Or? Friends' houses. Hung out there for a few weeks until my parents kind of finally let me back in. I don't know what the catalyst was. But you. But your mom did allow you. And my dad. And your dad mm-hmm. did allow you to start coming back. Yeah. And so. Um, so, you know, uh, this is going to be funny. I, uh, I've had this fear as a pastor of never wanting to be interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. I probably never will. So I I should get past this fear because I'm pretty sure this isn't going to happen. Never know. But the reason I fear being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey is every interview that I've ever seen where Oprah Winfrey is interviewing a pastor, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Rob Bell, Rick Warren. Every interview where she's interviewed a pastor, she asks them their position on gay marriage. Do they think being gay is a sin? What do they think about gay marriage? And it's like, there's like a lot of big questions in the world that, Oprah Winfrey could ask a pastor, but every interview that I've seen when she's interviewing a pastor, uh, when, and this this was especially when she still had her show on TV, but then when she first um, launched her network, like I watched, I watched these interviews with pastors, and so they'd have to answer the question, and it was almost like a line that, that are you on this side or are you on this side? It was like so that the whole world could know. And, and so I was like, man, I never want to, I don't want Oprah Winfrey. And it's not that I'm, that because I'm, I, I'm struggling with my position or I'm wavering. Yeah. It's just, it felt like, oh, in this moment in front of millions of people, you're going to be seen as either a judgmental pastor or a compassionate, loving pastor. Yeah. And my position is similar to yours. Um, you know, I, I haven't. Uh, been able to, as someone who believes in the authority and centrality of scripture, um, to find any text that would lead me to um, say that I'm fully comfortable um, officiating. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, the denomination that I'm in, I would I would be suspended. I would lose my credentials if I officiated a wedding between a lesbian couple, a gay couple. But I'm not I don't worry about that. Like the I, reason I don't officiate uh, a gay or lesbian wedding is not because I'm scared I'm going to lose my credentials. But um, if my gay friend or lesbian friend, gay relative, lesbian relative is getting married and they invite me, I'm going. I would go too. I'm going. I'm going to be at the reception dancing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hug them. I'm going to kiss them. I'm going to tell them I love them. Like uh-huh. I am going to be there. Um, and I and you know what? I think that position I get uh, from both sides because my relatives yeah. and friends go, well, do you really love me? Do you really love me? Because you wouldn't officiate my wedding. I'm like, I really, really love you. And then there may be people, you know, the um, – it, it, the evangelical friends of mine and colleagues that would say, "Are you really? Are you really rooted in God's word? Are you really? Are you really serious about Bro, God here?" And, and I'm I, like, "I am." You and I are 100 percent aligned there because I could never officiate a same-sex wedding, a gay wedding, because it's not aligned with my theological convictions, and I'd be compromising my integrity. I'd be compromising their integrity, and I it, it would it would just be a huge deal for me, character issue. Um, but I would attend a gay wedding. I I have mm-hmm. because for me, there's a big difference between the two. I can actually go to a wedding, um, and I don't even have to say congratulations. I can say, you know what? Um, I love you. Thank you for inviting me, dude. I'm so happy, you know, to be here with you in this moment. Um, I feel so honored that you invited me to be here. Um, you know, I love you. Let me know what I can do for you. Um, let me know how I can yeah. help. Um, you know, because there are some, I get this question all the time from parents when their kids are getting married and, um, you know, to somebody of the same sex. And so, uh, when they asked me this, I used to give them both sides of the argument because I'm like, I think it's like a Romans 14 issue, 
you know, whatever does not come from faith is sin, so you got to be sure of what God's telling you. But now I ask two different questions. Number one, when they ask me, should I attend, I say, okay, if you did not go, would you lose influence? Because influence is everything. If you lose influence in a relationship, the relationship's gone. I said, if you did not attend, would you lose influence? They said yes. I said, okay, second question. What would you be willing to do to keep and build influence in the life of your child? What would you be willing to do to earn the right to be one of the first people that your child calls or texts when life hits the bottom of the barrel? What, what would you, because if you miss out on this and you don't have that influence and they go through something hard and they don't turn to you, I guarantee you, you would give anything to go back in a time and to be able to do it differently, to have influence with your child. Yeah, that that's right on. I mean, I, I have family members that are gay and lesbian and, I love them dearly. I mean, I'm not, that, that's not like some like, oh, I'm just saying that to say that. Like there, there is a deep love uh, for them. And I don't want to lose the, the authentic, real credibility, relational depth that they would go. I can call my cousin Ephraim. Anytime. I can text him. I know he loves me. He is for me. He, yes, yes. And, and that's the, the fact that there is, I, I will just go ahead and say it, a significant uh, segment of evangelicalism that functions as if that credibility, that relational depth and dynamic is not a high priority to them. I feel like they're missing something about what it means to follow Jesus. 100% because... Um, it's a big hypocrisy. They, they rightly call out society for being ruled by false dichotomies. You don't have a voice. Some people think, unless you're an extremist on this side or the other side, we learned that from the last presidential election. We see that yeah. online. I wish we could just skip 2020. Remember how you could skip a grade in school? <laughs> yes. I wish we could just be promoted to 2021, just get the results and just move on with our life. And yeah. Because I think next year is going to be awful, and I'm, I'm praying for it. And I believe God can bring the good out of the bad, period. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's just going to increase the false dichotomies. And when we have individuals uh, like these uh, evangelical pastors or leaders who make this into a litmus test, if you go and you attend a wedding or something like that, you're just adding to the false dichotomies in society that you are criticizing a society for having. Yeah. And it's not, it's not apples to apples or oranges to oranges. So I want to be very clear. I do not draw um, apples to apples comparisons between um, the LGBTQ community and issues of race. I, I just don't. No, I, those I think, are two very I different I think they're things. two very different issues. And when people try to compare the struggles, the movements, the, the, um, it's offensive. the, 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 the ways in which those groups are oppressed and marginalized, they're real. They need to be dealt with, but they're not the same. I just wish people wouldn't do it. At the same time, I would go where you can make some comparisons is in, uh, well, like I would say it like this, um, the way in which Jesus, um, connected with Samaritans, with tax collectors, with those that were sick and diseased, mm. uh, with those, uh, who were poor. Uh, centurions centurions i mean i mean the one thing that jesus really was criticized for by the religious elite the the religious influencers was the way in which he uh navigated relationships with those they deemed the sinner mm -hmm. those they deemed the outcast the unclean mm -hmm. and i i feel like too many times there's a segment of the American church that sides with the Pharisees. Oh, 100%, bro. I could not agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. And I love what Pastor Andy Stanley says, that people who are nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked them back. Yes. You yes. couldn't say that of Caiaphas. Yes. You couldn't say that. You, you and I both have friends. Yes. That we keep in our life because they're difficult, and they make it. They make us more like Christ. Loving them is difficult. But you know as well as I do that 
they could not operate like that because having somebody different than them in their own world would threaten their world. Yes. And, and, and this is why I, I go, um, this sort of, um, country club tribal spirituality of almost like I, I I can have these really close friends that are Christians the same way I'm a Christian, but then I have to have this arm length relationship with these other people because it might, it might infect my relationship with Jesus. I'm like this. If, If you hanging out with people that didn't vote like you, that don't see human sexuality the way you do, that don't navigate uh, other um, ways of living life the way you do. If, if, if being in a deep, respectful, civil, healthy friendship, uh, a loving your neighbor as yourself relationship, if, if that threatens your intimacy with God, you've got a shallow spirituality. Oh, 100%. And I would say you can't have a strong intimacy with God and not be concerned about sharing the gospel because God gets the most glory when somebody far from him becomes a follower and a worshiper of him. And so I I look at that and I think to myself, what do you do with what, if, if that's really what they believe, what do they do with 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, where Paul says, I become all things to all people. Yes. What do you do with that? What, what do you do with 1 Corinthians 14, 16, 17, 23, and 24, especially verse 23, where it really challenges their idea of church? Because Paul says, when the whole church gathers together and you have, and there are unbelievers in your midst during the worship service and you start speaking in tongues, will they not think you're out of your mind? We, we spoke of so much on tongues, which, you know, that's what that chapter is about. We miss the very real scenario that Paul paints right behind it. Unbelievers worshiping when the whole church gathers together. That was a regular thing back then. And so, you know, I, I, I hear pastors all the time, well, well, you know, the church, you know, it's, 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 for, it's for believers. No. Church is made up of believers with a mission to share the love of Jesus with those who are not following him to the glory of God. The church is for God. Yeah. Period. No, I, yeah, I, you're absolutely right. And it's, you know, as an African-American pastor, I, you know, it, I think about this specifically in the context of the African-American church and the urban church and the multi-ethnic church. Um, and, you know, recently a video went viral of an African-American pastor um, basically uh, pointing out a, um, a transgendered or a uh, transsexual person sitting in their church. I don't, I'm trying to remember if it was just a man that was dressed as a woman or was going through a transition, but the pastor uh, points out to the person, has them stand up and tells them to leave his church. Don't come in here with that. Don't bring that in here. We follow the Bible here. We honor God in this place. And this thing went viral. Like millions of people watch this. And you know, it broke my heart. First of all, I hate that stuff like that goes viral. Um, I, I hate that um, because I never heard of the pastor before, never heard of the church before, and I just feel like that kind of theology, that kind of, of to me, antithetical to Jesus uh, bullying from the pulpit uh, needs to stay in obscurity. Mm. It, it, I mean, I, I, I don't want to see churches like that thrive. Let me just say it like no. that. You know what I mean? No. I, 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 so, um, Lampstands have been taken away. More will be taken away. Yeah. The church can, you know, churches cannot masquerade as churches when they're really, um, you know, members of the country club where you have to agree with us to be with us. Where does it say that? I mean, that pastor, it hurts my heart for his people. It hurts my heart for his own soul and his own relationship with Jesus. It hurts my heart because it gives uh, Jesus' bride a black eye in the midst of culture. Um, but it also hurts my heart because the guy's unbiblical. Right. Exactly. You don't, you don't, you don't do that. And, and he's just doing that because he wanted to draw attention. Look at how righteous I am. I'm telling this person to leave. Yeah. Dude, when did Jesus ever do that? He didn't. I mean, there were times when he said, Hey, you know, follow me, let the dead bury their dead. Yeah. But he never said, stand up. We see ya. 
we're going to put a piece of flair on you or something. Yeah. You know, leave. He never did yeah, that. Yeah, I want to. I just feel like the the one group that you can accuse Jesus of really going after were the, were the, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, you know, and, and, and today um, some of that spirit has infiltrated the American church. And I think Jesus mm. would spend more time saying, woe to you scribes, you vipers, to some of the people that are in the office I'm in than I think he would be telling people uh, outside the church how they're on the way to hell. Oh, um, absolutely. But let me let me go back to personalize this as we get ready to close. Um, so you're, fast forward a little bit, kind of help us see the trajectory of where your relationship landed with your father, with your mother. Yeah, so I, I moved back in. A couple years later, graduated, went to Bible college in Southern Missouri. Uh, for 11 years, I served on staff at a church in Los Angeles, uh, Shepherd Church, which I uh, think you're familiar with. Yes. Uh, then I was at another church in Dallas, Valley View Church, mm -hmm. um, for three and a half years. And then um, my parents, separately of one another, moved down there to be closer to our family. My mom's partner had died from cancer. They were together for 22 years. And unless a miracle happened, Vera went to go face the father without Jesus. Um, because I, I, I tried to share with her one last time. She actually, a week before she died, and she chose not to get treatment for cancer. So mm. she was going pretty quickly. And she opened up her eyes and she looked at me and she said, Caleb, what do you think is on the other side? And I said, Vera, Jesus is. And if you trust him right now, this same grace that will save you this very moment will carry you mm. into the next life. And she said, no. She said, I think people like you are weak. I think you use Jesus as a crutch. Mm. And I said, well, you're halfway to salvation because he's not my crutch. He's my wheelbarrow. Mm. He's driving the car and I'm not even in the back seat. He's got me duct taped, gagged and chloroformed in the trunk because <laughs> I can't live my life without Jesus. I'm too weak. And she said no. And it broke my heart. And my mom went through a deep depression. We had to move her out. She had bottles of wild turkey all over the house and everything like that. She lost the love of her life. Yeah, 22 years. It was hard. And so my parents separately one another moved to Dallas while we were there. They started attending the church I was preaching at, even though they knew what I believed. And they saw a whole bunch of Christians that loved them in the way that these people in my small group when I was 16 loved me. And two or three weeks in the summer of 2013, when I moved back to L.A., two or three weeks before I moved back, my mom and dad separately one another gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Wow. At the ages of 69 and 70. And they're still same-sex attracted. They're not in relationships. They believe in Jesus. They believe different things than I do about theology and politics, just like everybody else. Uh, how's all that go together? I don't know. God's grace is perfect. When it hits our, our messy lives, it looks messy. He's never called me to try to figure out the, the messiness. He's just called me to live in it. Yeah. So. Man, I appreciate you so much, brother. Hey, we had a messy conversation. Um, ooh, we might have made a lot of people mad. And this might not have been like what you wanted. You wanted to an answer. You wanted us to solve something. You know, that's why you got to keep watching these episodes because I'm going to keep coming back to topics like this. And uh, it's not just limited to this conversation that I had with a good friend and a brother. Hey, I want to close by saying, you know, I, I graduated uh, a couple months ago with my doctorate from uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. And uh, you text me and said, are you graduating? And we were exchanging some texts. So then I, I go to you know, I'm going through the graduation ceremony and, you know, when all the pomp and circumstance is over and I got my three bar robe on and I go out into the big open area um, uh, where they uh, had the uh, graduation at um, Lake Avenue uh, Church. And I see you standing over where well, you text me and say, Ephraim, we're here and we, we find out where we are. So I'm thinking, oh, there must be somebody else that you knew that graduated. And so I get to see you and you're like, man, I'm here because of you. Absolutely. And so, man, I just want to say that I just, I, I don't know exactly how I got on your radar screen, but it's been an honor uh, for me to know you, to follow you, to be blessed by your teaching and your ministry. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad that I'm in your, your cool group. Oh, dude, you are. I love this guy's books. If you've not read his books, go to Amazon, buy his books. That's how I got on, that's how he got on my radar. I've been a fan of his with that and with World Impact. Um, uh, 
you're doing a great work on the wall and you do not have time to come down. Oh, stay up on that wall. Appreciate you. Hey, we'll see you again in the future. City Beats, y'all. Beats.